most people aren't creative. <laughs> we all think that we're beautiful, unique snowflakes, but we're not. Right. Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today we will be talking about securing your digital life. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED38. So, it's now... Insert current year here. And increasingly more and more of our lives are being stored on online accounts. Um, not just our personal data, uh, you know, our, our photo backups and documents and stuff like that, but also, of course, our financial transactions and um, identity records, all kinds of stuff is, uh, is tied up in our online identities. Um, and so it, it really is becoming more and more critical for everyday people to become uh, not security experts, but at least competent at securing your online data. I'm going to structure this episode into a few different segments. Uh, first, we're going to be talking about things that attackers might be after, so why they would target you in the first place. Um, then we'll talk about some of the specific methods that attackers might use to gain access to our accounts. Uh, and then finally, we will go in in depth uh, into a bunch of different tools that you can use to keep yourself secure uh, on in today's digital world. As I was doing research for this episode, I realized that it would be a very good idea to uh, get somebody with a little bit more expertise than I have in this field. So I reached out to one of my old professors, Elena, at University of Minnesota Morris. I'm Yuliana Machikasova. I'm Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Minnesota Morris. I teach a variety of different classes, including cryptography, and I've been teaching this for about 15 years on and off, and I try to pay attention to developments in cryptography and security. All right, so let's talk about the things that attackers might be after. Well, ultimately, attackers are after things like social security numbers, credit card numbers, those kinds of things, but it's difficult to get them directly. So these are typically like um, financial incentives? Mostly, yes. Uh, there is corporate espionage, and that's a separate thing. But as an average citizen, you know, you need to be protecting your credit card numbers, you need to be protecting your social security number. And that's sort of the, the things that attackers are really after. Um, however, um, typically, these things aren't sent by email, for example. So uh, in order to get to them, an attacker needs your password or a reset link. And reset links, of course, are easier to get than passwords. So uh, that's the kinds of things that in practice you'd see attacks against. Mm -hmm. um, and they could be... Uh, phishing emails, so you get all of the, you know, click here and update your password kind of thing. Um, you get um, uh, fake websites, so those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there are also a few cases where... Um attackers will like if they get if they get access usually this is getting access to a device of yours they will encrypt the information on that device and then hold it for ransom right yes um, yeah your yeah. your device so yes so either your phone or your computer yes that's also kind of a thing mm -hmm. yes so that's where they yeah they don't directly value the stuff that you have but they know that you value the stuff that you have right uh, yeah yeah um and there's also a few interesting cases that I've come across where the like the the things that they value the attackers value uh, are not like direct financial things, but um, like but 
things about your account that might be desirable. So like if you happen to have a really, really good username on a particular service, right? Um, an attacker might be able to sell that to somebody. Um, recently, Reply All, which is a fantastic podcast, uh, had an episode where um, a listener called in and her Snapchat account had been compromised uh, and her pass or her her username was lizard uh and so they they went through the rabbit hole of tra- tracking down like who had stolen her uh her account from her and and um actually managed to get them in an interview which was uh <laughs> very very interesting <laughs> wow yeah yeah well that sort of thing happens well and getting direct access to your account say your facebook account allows mm-hmm. attackers to do things like send an emails from you or send you know messages from you asking for money and that also mm-hmm. has been um an attack that's um quite common and of course the way they get uh, access to your account may not be directly by breaking into that account but by gaining enough information so a password for another account that's the same as this one or um, answers to security questions sometimes if that's how you do a reset and then uh, go through that. You'll go through kind of back channel on that. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't considered that um, the account that they are currently trying to crack might not even be the end goal. It might be a step towards some other account that they might be trying to get into. That's a very good point. Right. Yes. Sometimes attackers will be after um, information that they can use for like intimidation. Usually, this is only a concern if if you know you are like a public figure, right? Um, and they they might uh, try to release your like personal information online for other people to use. Um, that's called doxing. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of different things that people can do with that information, right? If they if they like release your, um, you know, your street address, right? Then people could do uh, what's called swatting, where they they like basically call the police on you and uh, tell the police that you've kidnapped somebody or something, and then they break down your door. Um, right. Which is a, yeah, which is a, a very very scary thing um, that I think most most users are not going to have to worry about, but um, it, you know. If you are somebody who is in the public sphere enough, uh, that might be a concern. Well, I think you have to be careful with your account if you're storing Mm -hmm. anything that could be compromising. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to think about what happens if that is released. Mm -hmm. And that refers to, you know, private pictures that you intend to share only with a specific, you know, specific person or specific people. Right. So another thing that I kind of, I'm, I don't know if there is much evidence that that may happen, but if you are in a private situation, um, you know, maybe even covering your video camera, mm, mm-hmm. um, just to make sure that there is nothing that can possibly be recorded from that. Because there's been blackmail to average people when somebody has their um, nude pictures. And there were several cases when an attacker would turn on a camera or on a computer in a bedroom of a young woman and record it, record you know, video or take pictures and then blackmail. Mm-hmm. And that happens when somebody has access to your computer, so it's running a virus, but they're after not um, um, uh, any sort of passwords or any information, but something that they can either use inappropriately or blackmail, whichever they decide to do. Yeah. And so I think people have to be very careful with, you know, laptops open and on, even if the camera signal isn't on if they are in situations that could make them vulnerable yep and um there there are some i uh, i'm trying to remember the the newest macbooks that came out uh that were announced last month um i believe they have like a physical switch inside them that that 
completely disconnects the camera from the rest of the system uh under some circumstances i think it's when like when when the when the computer is locked or something like that mm -hmm. or maybe yeah um yeah then you, you know you, you can't accidentally uh leave that kind of thing like accessible right well and again we're talking about computers but that also is a vulnerability for cell phones yes definitely mm -hmm. or for devices like alexa echo yeah other internet of things uh devices yeah and actually speaking of those um sometimes an attacker who's trying to compromise a device that you own might not even be after like uh, you specifically, they might just want to add your device to a botnet uh, so that they can mm -hmm. perform like DDoS attacks against other people. Um, oh, sure. And in yeah. that, and in, and then in that, in that case, it's it's a very interesting like scenario in terms of the like the economic and incentives that people have in this in this situation because um, like the the end consumer doesn't really have much of a reason to care in that case that that their device has been compromised because it's somebody else who's being negatively impacted by by a device being part of a botnet well unless um you are in a position when your device might be shut down because it's sending these signals or uh -huh. unless uh it slows down uh, your computer yeah. Um, but I think we have to be careful because uh, there are various distributed computations that an attacker might perform on computers that they have access to, and it's basically just used as a compu as computing power. Mm -hmm. So like Bitcoin mining could potentially be used as a distributed service. Yeah. And in that case, it's costing you electricity. Right. As we talk about the methods that hackers use, we are going to skim a little bit across the surface of some uh, cryptography subjects. If you are interested in getting a little bit deeper into the topic of encryption, please check out The Extra Dimension number 9, where Ryan Rampersad and I uh, get a little bit deeper into encryption. Find the sh link to that in the show notes. There, there's a few different kind of categories that I would lump these into. The first category uh, that I would like to get into would be social engineering, actually, um, because quite often the like vulnerabilities in the systems that we use are not like technical vulnerabilities, but literally just like the you know the human who is in control of the system trusting somebody who they shouldn't. Um, right. So okay. First of all, uh, let me bring in a little bit of theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that if a company um, that, well, you either interact with or that you that provides security for your device um, has done everything right, mm -hmm. then it's literally impossible to break security parameters mm. so brute force what a great fantastical world we're living in here yeah so the keys for encryption um are such that it would literally take um you know thousands of years to do a brute force attack mm -hmm. <clears throat> another way of thinking about it is that uh the number of possibilities there is literally larger than the number of particles in the universe <laughs> and that's how many you need to try and so as human beings that invented math and invented a positional system where um, you can write numbers that are way 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 larger than anything that corresponds to anything in the world um, we can operate with these numbers and we can write them in a finite amount of time. So mm -hmm. the cool math part here, which may be of interest to your students, is that um, the value that a number represents is exponential in relation to its length. 
Whoa, I'm gonna have to parse that one for a little while. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let me let me put it in a different um, way. So when you add a digit at the end of a number, so let's say you mm-hmm. have uh, 100 and you added a zero, so you get a thousand. Mm-hmm. You multiplied your previous number by 10. Now mm-hmm. visualize that you had a hundred of something, and now you multiplied it by 10, and you have 10 of those little things that you had before, right? Yeah, so we're going up by an order of magnitude. Exactly, yes. And if you have a number that's a billion, Mm -hmm. I add one zero at the end, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to get a number that's 10 times a billion. So Mm -hmm. now Mm -hmm. imagine a billion, if you can, (laughs) and now imagine 10 of those. That's a much larger like in a, in a linear sense, that's a much larger difference than going from 100 to 1,000. Correct. And we operate, so security parameters for most algorithms are on the order of um, at least 128 binary digits, which if you roughly translate into decimal, um would be 60, again, I'm rounding down a little, 60 decimal digits, 60 okay. digits. So imagine 60 digits written on a whiteboard, how long that is. And every yeah. one of these digits effectively multiplies the previous result by 10 and then adds mm-hmm. some. So that's that's a huge increase. That's the kind of numbers we're talking about. And so brute force attacks on most of these things are literally impossible. Mm -hmm. So there is no such thing as direct breaking of encryption. So from there, what are we left with? Um, We're left with um, improper setup for security, Mm -hmm. um, which sort of boils down to protocol attacks. It's not what you use, it's how you use it. Right. And social engineering. These are basically the all of the things that you can use to break security of any kind. So even theoretical uh, vulnerabilities that exist that sort of amount to brute forcing are not practical. Mm-hmm. So, um, one of the hash functions that's used now, um, do I need to explain what the hash function is? Probably do, right? Yeah, that yeah, that would be useful. Okay. So a hash function is what's known as a one-way function. Um, it's a function that given the same um, input always creates the same output. The input could be anything. Um, so we can hash a single number. We can hash um, a um, file. So all of the contents of the file in binary. Um we can hash um, a textbook. Uh, the result is still going to be the same length. So it somehow it inco- incorporates all of that information. And so you're saying, so you're saying that uh, whether I am hashing an entire textbook or a single like eight character, yeah, you're gonna uh, get the same result. Password. The same length Bo- of the result. Yeah. Okay. The same cool. length of the result. And so. Um, and if, you, if you're hashing the same thing, you're always going to get the same result. So it's completely uh-huh. completely deterministic. And it has, uh, from the cryptographic standpoint, so um, hash functions that are used in cryptography or in security in general, um, have um, uh, certain properties. So one property is that if you know the result, you have no idea what uh, the input was. Right, because it's a one-way function. It's a one-way function, so, exactly. Um, so it's like you know breaking your ways into a million of pieces, and then you have to you can't put it back together, kind of. Um, mm-hmm. But you know the process that ex- the exact process that happened to get there. You just can't reverse it. The other property that we want to have is that probability of collisions. So two different things hash into the same result. Uh, is extremely low, again, in that sense of, uh, yeah, you can look for it in a thousand years and you can't find it. Right. Um, so that's sort of the desired properties. 
So, so okay, if, if direct brute force attacks uh, are theoretically impossible, what, what do attackers typically, what, what are their ways in? Right. Um, so there is a variety of protocol attacks. Mm-hmm. Protocol attacks are based on how you use all of that machinery that theoretically is impossible to break. But in practice, there may be ways, because of things are combined, to substitute particular parts of it and okay. um, recompute something that actually is fairly easy to recompute and make it look like genuine. Um, so one of the um, ways um, uh, authentication is done, so proving that you are who you say you are, and that's especially important for uh, you know, uh, e-commerce websites um, so that people don't um, throw together websites for a night and pretend to be Amazon, get all the money mm-hmm. and run away. Um, uh, there is a notion of a certificate that certifies that you are a legitimate business. And these certificates are digitally signed. Mm-hmm. Um so digital signature is an algorithm that uses um, uh, public key cryptography um, mm-hmm. and hash functions to create um, effectively um, a signed document, so a document that could have only been produced by the trusted authority. And so there are attacks on um, um, digital signers that mm-hmm. would potentially get a digital signature from them on something that they didn't intend to sign. And so that right. would be a protocol attack. The other attack in that um, sense is a man-in-the-middle attack. Yes. my That's yeah. my favorite name for right. a type of attack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's basically when... Um, uh, let's say Alice and Bob are uh, participants in some sort of secure communication and an evil person whom we'll call Oscar uh, pretends to be Bob to Alice and pretends to be Alice to Bob and effectively monitors all their communications. So um, although they're supposed to be encrypted, uh, they are encrypted differently between um, Alice and Oscar and Oscar to Bob. And so Oscar is sitting there sort of converting these messages, well, reading these messages and converting them into messages from Alice, in quotations, to Bob and to uh, from Bob to Alice. And so Oscar at that point, depending on what uh, kind of um, uh, knowledge of passwords and keys and whatnot uh, Oscar has, um, he can either send messages unchanged. So Alice and Bob had a conversation and had no idea that somebody else was listening. It was mm-hmm. actually the man in the middle sort of passing the messages um, to each of them. Or um, in some situations, Oscar can modify a message and pretend that Alice said this when Alice actually didn't say this and sort of mm-hmm. fake responses. Um, and so... Um, and obviously, when we talk about that, that's not a person. It's We're talking about communication between two devices and the device right. in the middle. Um, but that um, could be a possibility. Um, so that's um, another kind of attack. And I think another sort of group of attacks in that category are attacks... Um, based on improper clearing of um, um, secure communication sessions. So when you're in a hotel and you use the computer in the lobby, Mm -hmm. um, make sure to clear cookies and all of that. Right. Because uh, it's entirely possible that at the end of the conversation, some of that stuff could be left there and it could be left on your side, like because you didn't clear your, well, you clicked on remember your password, never ever click on remember my password. <laughs> just, just don't. So all of those things where um, you provide a secure session, but then you don't clear it 
carefully. So that could leak some information. And then there is social engineering going back to your original Mm -hmm. point. Um, uh, And social engineering, of course, if you're doing targeted attacks or sometimes not particularly targeted either, um, um, uh, that could... um, that's that's probably the main vulnerability. It's always, you know, most of the time it's people doing something silly. Uh, so um, most of security vulnerabilities um, are not in uh, the algorithms. They can't be because the algorithms are secure. Not in protocols because protocols are designed by experts. Um, but they could be either in improper implementation of protocols or not using the right protocols um, Mm -hmm. or more commonly in just users not following security uh, procedures and that right that's the biggest thing so like if you are on a machine that you don't know and you're in the habit of saying um, yeah remember that password that may be enough for somebody to get into your account. Um, And once they get into one account, they may get into a different account and so on. Um, Yeah. One movie... Especially if if the account that they got into is your email account, because that is typically uh, the authentication method for, um, you know, even if, even not for passwords, but for password resets, right? Right, right, right. Um, yeah. 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 If they got there, they got into everything pretty much. Mm-hmm. Your banks, your um, credit card websites, anything. And so you yeah. you have to be careful with what you use as your primary account um, and how you protect it. But social social engineering. So the kinds of things that come to mind are various emails that pretend to be, you know, from. Um, some legitimate person and mm-hmm. ask for your password. And so the usual rules are never, ever uh, send your password by email. Um, and be wary of, of links that are sent. Because um, right. they, 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 they will likely send you to a website that looks a lot like one mm-hmm. that, um, that you trust. Uh, and then it will prompt you to put in your username and password. And so training yourself to recognize um, th- how, how to know whether it's the, the legitimate website or not uh, is a, a vital skill uh, in today, today's day and age. Right. Yes. And if anything looks fishy, uh, Google is your friend. Mm-hmm. So um, Google, uh, that organization and go through their actual website. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, there is there is a bunch of things that can happen when you click on a link and, you know, it brings you somewhere and you download something and uh, or you just enter your password or you just answer a few questions. So mm-hmm. I think in that sense, um, yes, you do need to be uh, very, very careful. Um, and that's probably the most common, I'd say, um, ways of get way of getting into uh, an account um, without you know, proper authorization. Uh, if you talk about social engineering, I would imagine your primary target audience for that would be younger people and older mm. people. Mm-hmm. And both of these groups don't have don't know or can't follow best practices Mm -hmm. and so that could be really really tricky um and so yeah i think you know you and i if somebody calls and pretends to be from um you know computer whatever or like your phone company and asks for your passwords Mm -hmm. we would be on alert but many people aren't and I, I think it would. It's also worth noting that um, sometimes social engineering attacks aren't even targeted at the end user. Sometimes they are targeted at people who are within a company that you know has access to that whatever they want. Um, so sometimes it's not even 
up to you uh, that you know whether or not your account gets compromised. Um, I think a classic example is um, you know an, an attacker trying to get access to your um, your phone number uh, so that they can get like you know two factor co- codes that are being sent to your phone, uh, and they'll just you know call your cell phone provider and say like oh yeah I switched phones I need a new SIM card sent to me stuff like that. Um, Mm-hmm. And 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 so that's that's a system where like the the customer service representatives who are on the other end um, are like they're incentivized to make the person who is calling happy uh, and you know so sometimes proper protocols are not followed to make sure that you know the person who's calling is the person who should have access to that phone number. Right. Yes. Yeah, and as annoying as is as it is sometimes when they start asking all kinds of security questions uh, when you call, say your credit card company or your phone company, mm-hmm. cell phone company, uh, they are doing their job. Yeah. Yep. So uh, now it. If somebody calls you claiming to be your credit card company and then they start asking you questions, yeah, that's when you should be suspicious. If you called them though and you know who they are already, then you can answer whatever questions they need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's pretty clear that that's what they're doing. Yeah. No, it's it it's tricky. It's and I don't think that our society is very well protected. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, and one more kind of attack that I would like to bring in is what's known as side channel attacks. Mm. And side channel attacks on devices are attacks where there is something running on the same device. Um, So where, where the attacker has physical or virtual access to the same device that your secure stuff is running on, but they don't have access to your secure stuff directly mm-hmm. uh, when somebody is in possession of your cell phone. Mm-hmm. Even if your cell phone contents um, is password, password protected and or encrypted, yep. uh, they can still gain access if they very carefully monitor power consumption and or time. And you can do that if you have the device in your possession. All right, then let's get into the real reason that you are listening to this episode to learn about some of the ways that you can protect yourself. It all really starts at the beginning, right? When you are first creating an account, uh, you want to make sure that you are using a very secure password. Back about 20 years ago, which is a long time ago, especially for your students. (laughs) Feels like a long time ago for me, too. Yeah. um, There was a study that showed that um, if you run uh, the person's web page, so, you know, Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was kind of before social media, but people would have like a web page about them. Back when everybody had their own ianrbuck.com or whatever. Right, right, yeah. Um, And so if you just take all of the text from there and try all of that as your password, um, you're going to get in. Like there was Hmm. some something close to 50% chance. So that's publicly known information about you. And so is that a symptom just of people making, creating passwords that are based on stuff that they like... In their head, they thought nobody would be able to piece this together, but it's still based on who you are, and so right. the stuff the stuff that you've put out there publicly uh, can lead to to that sort of thing. Exactly, because people okay. use their favorite sports uh, teams names, mm-hmm. their favorite players, uh, uh, their relatives. Uh, some I've come across the the trope uh, in movies and TV shows, of course, of like oh. Their pet's name is whatever. Let's try that as the password. And I thought that was um, totally fake until I encountered it in real life when somebody shared their password with me. And I was like, are you serious? Yeah, Don't do exactly. that. <laughs> yeah. And people who think that if they changed an I to a one uh, and made it secure, well, everybody mm-hmm. changes an I to a one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so th- there are 
password databases that were leaked. And I browsed that thing. And most people aren't creative. (laughs) We all think that we're beautiful, unique snowflakes, but we're not. Right. Yeah. Although I've seen some very, very creative passwords, (laughs) (laughs) which I'm not going to repeat. Oh, boy. Yeah. But they were creative. I mean, seriously. (laughs) So um, Facebook has a whole bunch of these quizzes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That are like, what kind of ice cream flavor are you? And uh, I think people need to be very, very careful with those. They seem entertaining and people post all of these results and it it sounds like innocent fun. Uh, But some of these questions get very personal. And I basically, I clicked on one of these once because, you know, it was late in the evening and uh, somebody I know posted their answer. And so I, I looked and I got out of it in a hurry when the question came up on do you use uh, drugs recreationally? Hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm done with this thing. It's <laughs> creepy. Um, but I can also imagine that if somebody is trying to do, you know, some guessing on your security questions or on your password or on the kinds of phishing links that they can send to you that you would think are legitimate, you know, they do that sort of thing. Your password should be based more on phrases than um, on individual words. Um, okay. You should not be just adding numbers at the end. Um, because, again, you know, if you limit that field. So I mentioned that brute force saying, for instance, encryption key uh, or a hash function takes, you know, thousands of years. Um but brute forcing your password, if it's one of commonly used passwords with some variations, mm-hmm. does not take that long. And so um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and that creates this very interesting game of, well, you want to have a secure password, um, but you also want to be able to remember it. Yep. And you want to be changing it fairly often because that's also good security practice. Uh, and people are not quite set up this way. We're yeah, it's the that. it's it's the the issue of uh, increasing security measures to the point where it's no longer like convenient for the end user to such a point where the end user just says forget it all and does you know then uses insecure um, passwords. Yeah, hello. Because they just can't handle with, yeah. Yeah, hello 111, yes. <laughs> One of the common passwords. There are a few different schools of thought as to as to what you should do to solve this problem. Um, I used to have all of my passwords written down on a sheet of paper that was folded up in my wallet. The reasoning behind that being that uh, the collection of people who might be trying to gain access to my accounts and the collection of people who would be uh, able to steal my wallet from me uh, had virtually no overlap. So, um, so it was, it was a, it was a pretty secure way to store my passwords. Um, but it wasn't very convenient. Um, and we want to really strike a good balance between security and convenience because if if we try to use systems that are too secure and make it too complicated for you the user uh, then you probably won't uh, do a very good job of it because you will just start reusing passwords Um, so my advice is go and start using a password manager. A password manager is a program that can store your passwords for you uh, and can autofill them into uh, into the uh, pa- username and password fields on your websites and your apps that you use. Now, the best password managers will help you to create unique strong passwords by simply generating a random string of characters uh, and then storing those in your password vault. 
Uh, password managers can also help you avoid phishing attacks because uh, they will only fill in your username and password if you are currently visiting the correct website. Um, so even if you click on a link from a malicious email and it asks you for your uh, username and password, if the password manager does not recognize the website that you're currently on, then it will refuse to autofill it. And if you're wondering right now, well, what password managers are out there? Which one should I choose? Well, we have you covered for that as well. Uh, we just released a an episode of Second Opinion uh, alongside this episode of The Extra Dimension. And on Second Opinion, we are reviewing six of the biggest... Uh, most well-known password managers out there to help you figure out which one is the best one for you. So if you want to listen to that episode of Second Opinion as well, uh, that can be found at thenexus.tv slash SO54, um, or you can find the link to that in the show notes. One thing that actually concerns me a lot is the fact that like, um, even... Even if you don't use that approach to create your passwords, even if you you know create fully randomized uh, strings, th- like most, well maybe not most, but many accounts uh, have you create some like recovery questions, mm-hmm. right? Right. Which, which are by design asking you personal questions that in theory only you should know but we live in a world where we are like so encouraged to share so much of ourselves online that um figuring that stuff out can sometimes be quite trivial for an attacker um yeah absolutely (laughs) yes and at the same time your answer to these questions are not stable Mm -hmm. so you would forget but other people can still figure it out the way that I treat security questions is I also uh, generate not a random string of characters, but a, a random sequence of English words. Um, and I store those alongside my username and password in my password manager, which, you know, becomes very interesting than when I, uh, you know, if, if somebody is like with me, you know, maybe a customer service representative or whatever, uh, as I'm trying to answer these recovery questions is like, well, um, yeah (laughs) right it's weird yeah yeah but that may be a good way of doing this except then you have to trust the availability of your password manager true yes and so i mean this all of this game is very difficult to play if you think about you know where we store information how we access it Um, Mm -hmm. So I travel a lot and there are certain things that I can't afford to do. For instance, you know, if I store random things in uh, my electronic device, I wouldn't be able to um, access it if I don't have that device. Mm -hmm. And if they're not recoverable um, in any way other than in person and I'm, you know, in Russia, that just doesn't work. Right, right. So so you kind of have to be very careful. So that creates this sort of circle of, yeah, we're we're relying on this one thing. Mm -hmm. And if that one thing doesn't work, then what are we going to do? Now, if you want to add another layer of protection for your online accounts, you can use what's called two-factor authentication, which uh, combines something that you know, such as your password, with something that you have, which uh, is either your phone or like a USB key. There are a few different ways that two-factor authentication can be implemented. Um, my favorite way is uh, with an app that uh, you have on your phone that generates a new code every 30 seconds, and that algorithm is synchronized with an algorithm that is running on the server that you are trying to log into. Um, and so no messages actually have to be sent back or forth uh, in order for the, uh, the server to be able to authenticate the passcode that you give it. Some systems are set up to send you a text message when you are trying to log in, and they treat that as a two-factor authentication. Um, But it is fairly easy for hackers to gain access to your uh, 
phone number and uh, and intercept those messages, those those codes that are being sent to you. Which leads nicely into our next piece of advice, which is use services that seem to be doing security right. Um, you have to be extremely careful because um, when you are creating a password for a new account, um, <clears throat> sometimes an insecure service would sort of force you to create a very secure password that they don't store securely there. Mm, mm-hmm. So um, I, I think I mentioned this example in class once, but there was a university system that's no longer in place. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> for room reservation um, that forced me to create a password um, that had, you know, uppercase, lowercase digits, what have you. And so I was in a rush. And so what I did, I basically used my main university password. Um, and then it kept me logged in for like three or four months. So, of course, I didn't remember which password I created. And that's not the password mm-hmm. I started from. But this, the one, the ones that I started that were less secure um, didn't pass their requirements. Um, and so when I uh, when it finally logged me out and I needed to log in again, I started my low security passwords because I knew that I probably used something low security and it didn't work. And then I clicked on I forgot my password. And guess what ended up in my mailbox <laughs> in a few seconds? My password in plain text. In plain text. And so that was my main university password. So all student grades, all private email, all of that stuff. And at the time, I also had it, or I thought maybe I had it in a couple of other places. So I had, I spent half a day going through all of the (laughs) accounts that I could possibly have used that on and reset that. So, um, uh, so I think the worst thing that somebody like a service can do to you is to have very strict requirements for your password because that forces you to use a password um, that you used elsewhere that's pretty strong because it's very right. difficult to come up with a password on the spot. Or you can use a password manager, which is, you know, yep. it's yep. recommended to do. But if you're keeping track of your passwords manually, <clears throat> that... Um, that is how attackers get, oh, and it wasn't, that one wasn't an attacker. That one was <laughs> sort of just lack of clear thinking on the part right. of developers. And that's, and that's a challenge when you're like signing up for accounts is, you know, you don't typically know ahead of time what their like security practices on the back end are. You don't know whether they're going to be storing your password as a hash or in plain text. Um, well, in that case, I kind of knew. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times you kind of know. Mm-hmm. And you know it because their website is sloppy. And, you know, by the time you get to create an account, you kind of see um, that it was done by people who have no idea how the stuff is really done. This is where you can use the wisdom of the crowd. What is their reputation? Do they have a reputation for uh, good, solid security? Um, You can also take a look and see if they have a dedicated uh, info security staff on their their roster. Um, But uh, yeah, just in general... Does this does this website that you're signing up for give you a good vibe? Does it seem like it was built by a competent team? You also want to be using devices that seem to be doing security right. Um, so in particular right now, I am thinking about the Internet of Things, um, which has drawn a lot of ire from the, uh, the security community um, because there, there are many, many... When, when we start taking appliances and connecting them to the internet, um, this can create a lot of problems because there aren't very good incentive structures in place for the companies that created these uh, these devices to continue to update them for security. So you want to look for devices that come from companies that have a good solid history of uh, keeping devices up to date. Uh, and 
Furthermore, you have to actually keep them up to date. Uh, so if you have, if your computer, your phone, whatever, uh, gives you a notification saying, hey, we've got an update for you, please restart. Like, don't put that off forever. Okay, if you're doing something important right this second, like, yeah, put it off for a moment. But don't leave it for months at a time without updating your software. Consumer Reports has a really good article uh, of 66 Ways to Protect Your Privacy. I've uh, picked out a few of my highlights from this article. Um, If you want to read the whole thing, the link to that is in the show notes, of course. Checking the website Have I Been Pwned to see if any of your accounts, any of your email addresses have been a part of any uh, known leaks, any known security breaches is a really good way to know. Uh, Keep on top of whether or not you need to change any of your passwords. Speaking of email addresses, um, I would advise against using your public-facing email address as the recovery address for your sensitive accounts, um, because if somebody, if an attacker knows what your public-facing email address is, which they probably do because you give that out to uh, that information out to a lot of people, um, then that's one piece of the puzzle that they already have. If you have a different email address that uh, you don't give out publicly, then they won't even know what your username is, let alone your password. And if you're signing up for an account that you really don't care about, that you don't actually want to have, uh, you can use a service like 10 Minute Mail, which creates a, uh, a username and a mailbox for you that uh, will self-destruct after 10 minutes. And so you don't actually need to use your real email address for that at all. You definitely want to set a PIN or password or pattern unlock for all of your devices. Um, if it's got a screen, it should definitely be able to lock itself. Nowadays with fingerprint sensors and facial recognition software, uh, there really isn't a reason to not set a PIN or a password. Going along with that, you should encrypt your local storage. Most phones and tablets will do that uh, out of the box these days. Um, On desktops, you might have to go through an extra couple of steps to uh, get some extra software that can uh, encrypt the uh, contents of your hard drive. Um, And you should definitely keep an eye out uh, for whether or not the websites that you are visiting uh, encrypt your connection. Train yourself to look for that little padlock icon in the upper uh, left-hand corner that will uh, tell you whether or not it is encrypted. Quite often your online security also relies on your offline security, um, so you should definitely shred any paper documents that you get that have your social security number, your birth date, credit card number, bank account numbers, and medical insurance numbers on them because that's all information that uh, hackers could use as pieces that can uh, authenticate them as you if they are trying to use social engineering to gain access to your accounts. You should definitely be aware of what the software that you install on your devices does. Um, In particular, I would like to highlight uh, browser extensions. Browser extensions are one of my favorite tools to use to improve my digital life. Um, But you really need to be judicious about the ones that you install because quite often the extensions that you put on your browser uh, have access to read the entire contents of every single web page that you visit. Um, In particular, one that uh, I actually used back in the day called Stylish, which would allow you to uh, use custom styles for any website that you visit. Uh, They were caught being naughty. They were sending uh, information back to their server about all of the uh, websites that you visited. One browser extension that is actually a really good idea to install is HTTPS Everywhere. This is from the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, a very, very good organization. Um, This is an extension that will uh, force every website to use an HTTPS connection, a a secured encrypted connection, uh, if they have one available. App permissions is also a very important thing to be aware of. Uh, When you're installing apps on your uh, phones, 
quite often they will ask for permission to access some part of the operating system, whether it's your location or some sort of sensor or access to your contacts list or something. Um, yeah, just think about it. And does it make sense for the uh, app that you are using to need access to the thing that they are asking for? Also be aware of what third-party services you are uh, giving access to your accounts. Quite often when you create a new account, they, uh, they may try to get you to sign up for an integration with, say, Twitter. Um, and uh, and they, that may give them access to uh, read your personal direct messages. It may give them access to post uh, on Twitter on your behalf, um, stuff like that. So always, always be aware of what permissions you are giving to, uh, to services. Virus protection can be very important because, uh, well, you're only as secure as the devices that you are using. So if your device gets compromised by a virus, then um, you are in a lot of trouble. Most operating systems come with very competent virus protection built into them. But if you are more paranoid or if you uh, regularly go to less reputable websites, you, know, you may want to go for a uh, an extra third-party virus protection plan. And if you download a file that you are a little bit suspicious of, of course, you can always scan it locally. Um, and there are also online uh, options, such as uh, you can just upload a file to Google Drive, for example, and Google will uh, scan the file for you and may be able to highlight something suspicious about the file without you ever having to put it onto your hard drive locally. Pay attention to warnings that are given to you. Most uh, email systems will highlight um, messages that they think might be spam or phishing attempts. Um, most browsers will warn you if you are going to visit an insecure website. Um, though, you should definitely be aware that sometimes attackers will try to pose as a warning and, uh, and will try to get you to click on the warning itself. Um, so learning to recognize the difference between those two is an important skill. Be aware of what information you are putting out there online about yourself. Um, we talked about being wary of Facebook quizzes that are trying to possibly get answers to your recovery questions is one thing, um, but also just the basics of um, don't accidentally post your own address or something online. As much as I believe it is valuable to support online creators in their endeavors, um, I do have to admit that ad blocking can be a very good tool to, for protecting yourself online because uh, many, many times the, uh, the way that, that phishing attacks or viruses get to you is through online advertisements. Uh, and if you want to learn more about ad blocking, you can go and listen to the extra dimension number 11 link in the show notes. Be wary of open Wi-Fi networks. Uh, when you go to a coffee shop or an airport or any public space uh, that seems to have a, a free Wi-Fi network, um, you know, you might think, score, awesome, I don't have to pay for this internet. Um, but you never actually know whether the person who set up that network is the shop that you're in or if it's just somebody walking around with a backpack that has a, um, a cellular hotspot in it, uh, and they may just be recording all of the traffic that goes through their router. So if you do want to use open Wi-Fi, uh, it might be a good idea to go and grab a VPN. A VPN is a virtual proxy network, which... Um, basically means that any any messages that you send, any traffic that you send, uh, will first go to a single server um, that is run by the VPN, and, uh, and then they will send off your requests to uh, whatever websites you are going to. Um, so it's a way to mask your, um, your browsing um, and also to force encryption because typically your connection to the VPN itself will be encrypted even if the uh, connection to the website that you're visiting normally would not be encrypted. And finally, all of these other pieces of advice have been specific ways for you to secure your own personal account. Um, but 
we can all get a little bit more secure if we work together to change the climate uh, around these issues. Um, and I think the, the best way to do that is to put on political pressure for governments to treat cybersecurity and digital privacy as important as any other human rights. Governments have a lot of influence in this area, in particular um, organizations like the NSA will... Uh, research and find um, exploits and bugs in systems and quite often instead of alerting the company behind that software to the uh, to the bug that they found they will just keep on hold on to that exploit and try to use it themselves um, and this creates a problem quite often when uh, hackers gain access to those databases that uh, government entities have been holding on to and uh, and then the exploit is uh, is out there in the world and known before the company that needs to update the software knows about it um, so I recently came across the concept of a digital Geneva convention um, which calls on world governments to make agreements uh, regarding cybersecurity, um, and there is a, a whole list of, of tenants that goes along with this digital Geneva Convention. But of course, this kind of thing will only move forward if there is the political will to do so. So putting on uh, political pressure to our representatives uh, regarding this kind of thing uh, can be a very, very good move. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension. This show is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so if you want to take any part of it and do anything that you want with it, you can, as long as you link back to our original page, which again is thenexus.tv slash TED38. The Extra Dimension is a production of The Nexus TV. We are a network of technology-focused podcasts based in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, you can go to our subreddit at r slash The Nexus TV. If you would like to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused educational content, you can go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash thenexustv, uh, and you can get some pretty good rewards over there. In particular, uh, Elena and I got a little bit more in-depth into some of these topics, and if you want to hear more of that conversation, you can listen to the Fringe episode uh, associated with this episode, which is exclusive to our patrons on Patreon for the first four weeks. I have been your host, Ian Arbuck. You can hit me up on Twitter at Ian Arbuck or on my personal website, ianarbuck.com, where you definitely cannot find any of my passwords. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. Tech news is dominated by big announcements with big bombastic personalities. Developers, 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 developers. Sometimes they make us laugh. Yes, I'd like to order four thousand lattes to go, please. Sometimes we laugh at them. Courage. Sometimes we're filled with awe. There it is. Whoa! Check that out. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. They never want us to forget. Remember that the show's never over, because I got one more thing. Now, it's often difficult to make the journey to see these events live. This is a freaking dirt road! Oh my god! <laughs> but we here at the Nexus TV have got you covered. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. So come join us as we explore the brave new worlds that await us. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today.